following how they, how they want to be, how they want to think, has become the primary source of reference. And it also dominates how and what we think of ourselves. They call it a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's another change that's going around now. They want you to change your identity. How do they do it? They make you feel guilty of being a Muslim in America. How to maintain your identity in America? How do you do that? Because one of the ways of conditioning and changing you negatively is to do what? To make you feel bad about who you are so that you can conform what they call the melting pot. So everyone wants to conform to what the society is doing, especially after 9-11. After 9-11, it was a drastic change in the Muslim community. People begin to fear of being a Muslim. Some people shave their beards. Some people just can't grow them, so that's different. Some people just camouflage themselves like a chameleon to try to look like. Some people raise the high flags, five and six flags on their balconies. Yeah, we're American. No, I'm not criticizing Amer being American. But what I'm criticizing is when you make other people feel bad for not being American. When you get people to want to be like you because we're backwards. So this is another change that's happening. So everyone started changing their name. I went to a gas station, the brother, I remember his name was Abdul Sami. And all of a sudden he became Sam. I seen it on his tag. He was Sam all of a sudden. Aslam like Abdul Sami. He acted like it wasn't him. He acted like it wasn't him. He was in front of some man with a business suit and he acted like it wasn't him. How you doing? He said, How you doing? I said, Salaam alaikum, brother. How you doing? They put pressure. That's what you call peer pressure. Transform, right? So this is the dominant factor of how they make us feel how we think of ourselves and how we define our problems and shape our actions so that now if you're not this way and that way then you're definitely either you're with us or you're with the terrorists as Mr. Bush said and it made people just cause this split in diversity people begin to change for the wrong reasons all the lions and the speakers begin to sound like Cinderella. Before oh, Lord is that about 9-11 come, everybody. Unity, Islam is peace. Everyone is, we are the same. We believe the same. We all part of the same religion. Everyone just started changing their speeches, changing everything. We're part of the Abrahamic faith, Christian Jew Islam. This is wrong. Wrong dawah. No. Abraham did not teach Christianity, nor did he ever teach Judaism. It didn't even exist. So why are you saying this? It didn't even exist. Allah made it clear Abraham was neither a Christian or a Jew, and he definitely wasn't a Boletheus, one who committed shirk. Clearly. So it even changed how we speak and our actions. In short, how we perceive the world, unfortunately, a society that has become so addicted to immorality and entertainment in order to function is not exactly a society that is prepared to face the hard realities, let alone change and even more sacrifice. Addicted to entertainment. <coughs> if you look at the entertainment industry, Everyone is changing in the wrong way. And what is it? It's subliminally trying to get our children to accept these people as role models, authentic role models. So that when Madonna came out, we seen all the girls who wanted to wear like a virgin dress and all the, you know. Then when the next one, Lisa Lisa, well, that's way back in the days. And then you had the, today, the Rahana, I guess, Rahina, Rahana. Ray Hannah, right? Yeah. Then she comes out, another goddess. Then you got the other one who is uh, Nikki Minaj, Minhaj, Nikki Minhaj, right? Nikki Minaj. 
the Mickey Minaj, Nikki Minhaj, the Minhaj of Nikki, <laughs> was to be in a cave naked, showing our children these things. This is how they begin to change, change you into something other than what the Prophet was telling us. And so we see how these things affect our well-being. And that's why it's very important for us to understand the process because Hudayfa was wise in his questioning the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, everyone used to come and ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the good. But I would like to ask him about the evil so that I won't fall victim to it. This is a wise thing. Because everyone teaches good, don't talk about bad. And so, therefore, most people fall into it. And so, there's a process of change, right? But as, as, just as much we're trying to keep the fortress around our children to, to, to be and to change their negative aspects of themselves to a good aspect, there's also elements, what we call exploitative agents. These things that's causing you to be other than Muslim, other than being upright, other than being good and moral and honest and truth. There's other aspects and forces working to reinforce their dawah. So we look at change from one perspective. No, we have to look at it from every perspective because at this level, collectively, you see that our children are losing. That when they're not proud to be Muslim, you have to allow them to be Muslim. All right? So, one of the things that I wanted to mention in closing is it was a man named Frederick, Frederick Hergel. Frederick Hergel was a man in the 1700s, a philosophy that he had this called the Hegelian dialect. The Hegelian dialect. See, we want to currently give them current events as well. And the Hegelian dialect was a psychological method, which is a process used to do what? Get a person to change their beliefs. Now, this is the serious part here. Yes, you had a question? Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Inshallah, the Hegelian dialect is a psychological method which is a process used to get a person to change their beliefs. To do what? To match those who want them to change their beliefs. And it works like this. They use a diverse groups to dialogue to consensus of interfaith. This is where this interfaith, now let me make something clear. There is a missionary group from this Hengelian dialect. They use the word interfaith. These individuals are trained to <coughs> go out to change the ideas and beliefs of other religious people. Just when you think that you're given dawah, they're not changing their beliefs. They're missionaries to change yours. They're not going to move. They're not going to turn away from Jesus because they already are in a think tank preparing how we should change other people's beliefs. So this is a group that was sent out to basically once uh, Frederick said we can get the the thesis, we can get a person to sit down, then we are in a better advantage to change the way they think. So much that he says, well, we are all the same. We do believe in the same God. We do believe in Abraham. Get us on common grounds of what we all believe in and what we can come to a common consensus. Then they begin to say, we can dialogue. But the dialogue is this. They're not changing their beliefs. They're not. They're already sent out and trained not to change their belief, but to change ours or to change the people who they're going to. So basically what happens is that they call this is the thesis. There's the thesis, the antithesis is somebody who's different from you. And the moment that the two of you who are different are in the same room, 
there's a potential relationship. And the synthesis is agreement in the relationship. So now, I was looking at an article. Uh, it was a paper, right? And it used to say, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Right? From this mission and from this group dialogue, after a while, after the process of this, this, this dialogue, I began to see again that in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, was taken off. And it was in the name of capital G dash little d. And I was like, wow, what happened? What happened to this process that we take off the name of Allah, one of the greatest names, personal names of Allah, to in the name of capital G dash d. And I asked the person sincerely, why? I went to the person. Why, this, why is that meant? Because what we're trying to do is give dawah. I said, how could this be given dawah? No, because people don't understand the name Allah. Really? So I said, wait a minute. Are we trying to conform to the, to the, to, to the ideology of the people or are we, are we getting dawah or are they giving us dawah? No, they don't understand Allah, so we say G-D. The reason why I wouldn't go G-O-D because D-O-G backwards means dog. When we know that Allah don't mean God at all, it doesn't. We can easily say in the name of Allah, meaning Allah is the creator of the heavens and earth. He's the one who created the sun, the moon, and the stars, but he is Allah. They took it off and it's G-D. And this shows you the type of process that these groups are going out. It's called the Hengelian dialect. All you have to do is look it up online. And just as us, as we're trying to change to stay Muslim, there are people who are organizing groups to try to make us be different. Now, I have no problem with dialoguing and having some kind of relationship with the people of the book, and, but there is also boundaries. Because we do give dawah, we respect them, we, we have to invite them, they're our neighbors, we live here, we're in America. But at the, not at the expense of changing anything that Allah and His Messenger has forbidden us to do. And it's not that serious that we have to conform in this form of change. But we need to perfect our behavior and incorporate the Quran in our actions and begin to try to emulate the best example that we face in our history, in the Sunnah of the Prophet of Islam, so that we could be successful. And the only success that we will get if we use him as this model and continue to instill in our kids. Let the children feel uh, proud to be a Muslim and never to hide your identity no matter what the odds are because Allah is the one that's going to be pleased with you and you want to make sure that Allah is pleased with you and at the end of the day it doesn't really count what people think of you. It's who your Lord wants you to be. Perhaps I have to tell you something. As regards to interfaith dialogue, since there is ayah Surah al imran if I'm not wrong, I have 82, I believe. No other religion acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except Islam. All mankind, you will die before you become a Muslim. And after this invitation, this message you kind of send to other party, why should you go for interfaith dialogue? We are going to tell them about this. Whenever you go for interfaith dialogue, we are talking about us, and they talk about them. And there is no solution. We have nothing to tell. Listen from them. We have the message. These are our responsibility to convey the message. If they accept it, alhamdulillah. If they don't, it's up to them. MashaAllah. This is exactly what I was saying in this, this uh, the guy called Hegel. His mission was he financed schools of religious people. Not for them to convert to the religion of others, but for others to convert to them. And so that's why I say this kind, this kind of particular movement I'm talking about, as you said, is very dangerous because they're not coming to no solution. Every year you hear they'll come to Ramadan, they don't take Shahada. They come to, they see you make Shahada, they don't even think about being Muslim. They, they're just trying to get common grounds where, that, where you can start modifying and changing. So words start changing around now. You know, people was afraid to use Jihad. 
you know, people was afraid to use, that they're, they're talking about polygyny. People started saying that it doesn't mean it is a spiritual. Everyone started modifying based on what the pressure of society was doing to dumb down and downsize the, the words that Allah would use. So yes, brother, I agree, and this is what I was, why I brought that out was particularly, but now there are some people, like you said, the Christians who give da'wah to them, and, and that's it, if they don't accept, they don't accept. Like he told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you cannot guide the people who you love. He, you can't, you know? And they will only accept if Allah opens their heart to Islam. You know, so alhamdulillah. Yeah, brother? Yes, uh, I asked the same question, brother. I, I asked the person, what does that mean? And they, it's really a, a Kabbalist, uh, a cult, uh, come from the, the Ashkenazis, the so-called, they call them Jews. But it's a group of Ashkenazi, uh, again, I, I don't call them Jews because I know they're not, but they call themselves Jews. And it's a little occult group that they use in Kabbalism. But I asked, what, did, what does it mean? And there was no, I got no explanation of what it was. It's, it's just there to symbolize God. And it's a terrible way of symbolizing Allah. So it really has no meaning in the sense of true meaning. Uh, they have a, a, an agenda towards it, but it was something that I asked, I asked you the same, I asked the same question you asked. So I really don't know the, like again, GD doesn't mean anything to us as Muslims, you know. Allah is Allah, you know, and we accept every attribute that he described himself by and the messenger described him by, inshallah. So, Tariq, one question to you. Yeah. Uh, the people, you have seen the both sides of the coin, you know. The people who embrace, you know, uh, Islam, they took shahada. They become strong and strong after taking the shahada. On the other side, the people who are born Muslim, majority of them they go down and down and down. You see, it's not only the Asian and Pakistani, but even the Arab you now. Yes. So, uh, what do you think? So, what, what, how can we bring them back? You see. You know, this this is something that is a very uh, this topic is in, in in dealing with this is very serious because. Most of the time, the people who know what the mud tastes like, who, who have tasted the mud, played in the mud, you know, understands the other side of, the, of Jahiliyyah. And when us as a people who converted hit rock bottom, when Islam comes to us, we gravitate towards it because we know what we had is nothing. And we know the reality of it because we was living that lifestyle. So we embrace Islam as, a, as being rescued, and it, it affects us. Just like Umar Ibn Khattab said, the people of Jahiliyyah, they have two things. is that they have the experience of Jahiliyyah, and then they have Islam, right? And on meanwhile, the people who were raised Muslim, it seems, they, like you said, it's a diverse situation where they begin to lose what they basically were raised on. And a, a lot of times, people be practicing the deen based on culture. It becomes a custom and a culture to them. Oh, that's our culture, that's our custom. And so they begin to practice Islam as a culture instead of as a deen. And so they live off of the inheritance of the history of their great-great-grandparents or my parents was Muslim and we made salah and we wear the hijab as a culture, as a custom and not truly as the deen of Allah. So a lot of times this is what takes place in the, 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 the two sides here where people who are raised Muslim, you, you would believe that they will stay, stay to stay on the straight path. But then, again, it's based on the parents in the homes, how they instituted Islam, you know, and, taking the, and being complacent just because you had Muslim parents, relying on, yeah, I had Muslim parents, I was born Muslim. You say, yeah, I was born, everybody, I'm born Muslim. Yeah, like there's some birthright to this. Yeah. Because if we were born Muslim, then it would be a different perspective. But we were raised with Muslim parents, so therefore it's incumbent upon you to have more sense because of what you've been raised with first generation parents. You know. So those are the, the diversity that you see here that's happening. 
uh, and how could we bring them back is that basically, of course you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens their heart to follow it, but it's they themselves have to return back to the Sunnah. They have to return back to the Quran and the Sunnah sincerely and start applying what they've been raised on and, and not have it theoretically, but they have to have it practically in their lives. So it's all about returning back to the way of the, uh, of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. Who? Who is that? <laughs> He's a singer. She? Yes. I, 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 I have no idea about her. <laughs> I, uh, but I, I advise you, maybe uh, if she's on the stage doing certain things, maybe you should watch her <laughs> or listen to her. <laughs> I sure don't know who that is, me. <laughs> Mashallah. But what you want to learn is about the Sahabiyas, the women like Aisha, Fatima, Khadija. These are the Sufiya, Sumeya, Romesa. All of these women who are great in Islam. You get the women around the messenger. There's a book called The Woman Around the Messenger. Read about their personalities. You'll be enlightened by how they were. secularism you know uh, and when you look at this which as you said have changed that religious became a private affair secularism the dangers of secularism is secularism divorces the religious base affiliation from the lives and application of the people so that now religion is dumbed down to a private affair hmm. worship your God in the closet but it has no significance to our political affairs. <coughs> so now, work is more valuable. Work, 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 work. Worship one day, Sunday, right? Five days of work, so many hours, one day for God. That's your private business. So that's why they separated church from state. And unfortunately, the Muslims got polarized by it. The Muslim countries, they begin to settle for just being presidents of a Muslim so-called country and dividing the religion and the affairs between the president and the Amir. Secularism. So it has affected the Muslims big time in the world and that's why there's no centralized leadership to bring back the establishment of the Khulafa to set the stage for the Muslims where that in those times, you know, everything closed down when it came to the ibadah of Allah. Everything was centralized by the Qur'an and Sunnah. And of course, the history with the Ottoman Empire and the Turks and the Arabs, they separated them and destroyed the, the, the Khulafa, which caused them to have a spiritual bankruptcy. So now there's so much now, like you said, they're in the dunya more, worshiping the dollar and having a part-time worship for Allah. And still we want to have the name Muslim. You know, and this is what has damaged the Muslim community today. And they take it more serious. 
more the political world, more than the religious world. And like you said, the Zahid is the person who de do things in measure. Abstinence from the worldly things, meaning those things that destroys your hereafter, you know? But only particularly, like you said, he does things in measure, meaning he only takes that which is necessary for his existence in this world. And he works towards his hereafter more. And the Prophet said, those who want this world, they will get it, but they will lose the hereafter by wanting it. And those who strive for the paradise will get it, but at the expense of losing this world. So we have this imbalance with the Muslims, as you mentioned and pointed out beautifully, that we've been secularized. And the subsequent part is, what's the practical way to do this? Get the right life, you know, the life of the companions. I think the Muslims need to return back to reading the Sirah because that in there gives you the whole biography and the whole mission of the stages and development of how the Muslims should bring back those golden days. And until we do that, we will be in the state that we are. And as time go on, it's get worse in, in order for it to get better. But Allah says he will never leave the believers in the state that they are in until he distinguish the wicked from the evil. He will purify the ranks, you know, and that time will come according to when the law does. But unfortunately, we in the state, and for those who are striving to continue to keep that legacy, we have to strive harder ourselves individually with our families and save them, you know, uh, because at this level, we see collectively it's a big job. It's, we've gone so far away, you know. Yes, I think. Uh the problem was created when the Ummah left the effort of deen 500 years ago. When the effort of deen was going on, the deen was in the life of everybody. Mm -hmm. Sooner they left this effort, yes. so deen went out of their life. Yes. And now, if the Ummah wants the deen in their life, they have to come back on this effort. Yes. And not only one jamaat, one person, everybody, every adult Muslim man, woman, old man, even the child, you can see that she was asking you the question. Mm -hmm. But she should also know that how we have lost the deen. Everybody will come on the effort of deen. And the, you are also struggling for the same way. Nobody is denying this effort too. But actually deen will come in our life the way the Prophet and his companions did the effort of deen. What they did, they took their own body, own effort, and own money, own time, and they spread all over the world. I was in Pakistan, born in Pakistan. No prophet came there. Somebody came, somebody born in Africa, New Zealand, Australia, no prophet came. All the prophets came to the Arab countries. So, how come I'm getting this glorious gift of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? With the effort of the companions and the prophet. On the last khutbah in Orfa, once he asked the companions, are you are agreed? Are you, are you witness that I have delivered the real message to you? Three times the same question as they said a prophet of Allah, we are our witness. It's not that you deliver the message, you have fulfilled the right of delivering the message to us. Then he did say that we are done. He said now this is your job to take it to the people who are not present here. You and we were also not present. They did this effort, we got this glorious gift. We were supposed to keep on doing this effort. Today, the whole country, which we are talking about these people that are cultured, actually we are responsible to put them in this culture. If we could have done all the effort of deen, so just like somebody invited you and Allah has blessed you with this uh, glorious gift of la ilaha illallah, so these people could have got this. And we were all, mostly the Muslim people, only just like the Jahan Abu Lahab, those who deny the invitation and the facts, they could be in kufr, but otherwise everybody could have got Now the solution is, where the problem is created, the same is the solution of the same thing is, that the Ummah will come back on this effort, Inshallah Allah will bring the deen in our So we request you to kindly want to talk to the, to the people and they ask you the question like my brother this uh, for um, uh, Frasar said to you, so you tell them the solution, that come back on this effort, Allah will bring the in of life in so, absolutely, absolutely. Right. So we also request you that if you can join such type of effort, Allah will give you a big reward in Mashallah. The, the other thing we, we want to look into the Quran, in the ayat says, you know, there are those who go out and fight, 
And there are those who go out and give thou, and there are those who stay behind to teach and learn. So here, this shows you the balanced, that everyone doesn't go out to do the same thing. But there has to be a group of people who do it. This is definitely you have to do. So we can see the efforts that you're talking about is very humdullah, to go out and do dawah, and at the same time, you know, you have people who uh, go spin for the cause of Allah. They may not be on the same level of physical jihad, but they spin. They are contributing towards the objective of spreading the deen. And so we see how the, the Quran gives the balance of how our interaction in this method of dawah. So alhamdulillah, uh, you know, we uh, just try to, like you said, we have to come back to the remembrance of Allah and develop the relationship with Allah that we should have in our lives because this is the key. You know, if Allah sent and created humankind just to worship Him, we must go back to that worship. And again, application sometimes missing in, 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 in our, our efforts, the application, you know, uh, the disagreement, the disunity and the different opinions are, are all part of the discourse that keeps us from actually being effective in our environment. You, you know, people with the different uh, ideologies, uh, you have, you know, the great four Imams who are the great uh, scholars that are amongst this Ummah. We don't even know how to be good followers of them. We misrepresent good leaders by, I am a Hanafi, I am a Shafi, I can't marry a, a hum you know, this never was mentioned out of the mouths of the people who you are claiming to. I mean, even they themselves learned from each other and they said, the math app, my math app is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Clearly, we get clear statements from these great scholars, but yet then we still have people who come with diverse issues from the same people who they claim that they follow.